Wonderful. All right, everyone, thank you so much for, for joining me this afternoon. I'm really excited to be uh, presenting this information that I, I worked so hard on um, in going through my dissertation um, at Aurora University. And hopefully you guys get a little bit something out of this um, that you can take back to your everyday practice. I was telling Arlen a little bit, um, I'm feeling a little, little weird here just because my eyesight's not with my webcam. I went, I went home, bought a new webcam for this, all jacked up. Well, I like playing video games at home, so I have a big old monitor here, so it's sitting above my head. So I swear I'm looking at you guys at my presentation, even though we aren't at eyesight. So the burnout dilemma, let's talk a little bit about burnout, our jobs. I know this is something that's been talked about quite a bit um, with just within our profession, right, over the past few years, especially coming out of COVID. Um, so let's look a little bit at, at what we can do with burnout this puppy. All right. So first, we're going to talk a little bit about actually, you know what, let me back up just half a second for you. So um, the one thing I didn't do is kind of say, so I am a high school principal at Indian Creek High School is in Shabana, Illinois. So just about 20 minutes south of DeKalb. Um, before that, I was a dean of students at Oswego East High School for three years. Um, and then before that, I was a science teacher at Marengo High School. So I'm entering my 10th year of education. Um, give you a little bit of an idea of where I've kind of moved around and some of the experiences I've had. And the idea for this, for this study really came out of my time as a dean of students at Oswego East High School. And I'll get into that a little bit more as we go forward. So we're gonna we're gonna go over a little bit about what we're going to be covering today. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna talk a little bit of background, a little bit about you know, where this study came from, why I thought about doing it, um, give you a little bit of idea of, of where this came from so you can kind of better understand some of the results that were found from it. Um, the second thing we'll cover is what this presentation is and is not. Um, burnout's complicated, right? Self-care is complicated. These things are, are very individualistic um, and everybody's a little bit different. So we'll kind of cover hopefully what you will get from this presentation, um, as well as what won't be covered if you're looking for that. Um, then we'll define burnout. We'll look at what, heck, what the heck is burnout, all right? How is burnout defined? I think you see it all the time. You've maybe felt it, that little feeling, but let's put some, some words to it on what is it. We'll also look at the definition for self-care as well. Um, one of the things that really bugs me, and I'll get into it a little bit later, is you know, you go, you go on Twitter, you go online and everyone's uh, practice self-care, self-care, self-care. Well, what, what is that, right? So we'll dive into a little bit about what is self-care rather than just everyone saying, hey, do it, it's great. Um, and that'll give you guys a little bit better idea of, of maybe where to take it in the future. Um, then we'll look at the overall question, right? Does the self-care work, right? So that's kind of um, the question we were studying, does it work? And there are a few facets that we look into with that. From there, we'll look at the findings from the study. Uh, there are a few things we'll dive into a little deeper, a few that are a little more surface level, um, but give you a really good idea going forward of, hey, these are some things I can do. These are some things I should stay away from um, when you're looking at practicing self-care and how that relates to the feeling of burnout. Um, and then finally, we have some implications that we'll go over. I have them broken out um, by your, your position currently, if you're a building administrator, if you're a district level administrator, um, also if you are, you know, working at like a school board level, a district level, or even at the, uh, you know, legislative level and how that can, can affect what we're doing within the schools every day. So we're going to start out with a little bit of background. So when I got to Oswego East High School as a Dean of Students, um, I was working with a caseload of a little over 900 kids doing discipline and attendance all day long. Uh, really good experience, I think really has set me up for some great success. Um, going into now being a principal of my own building, um, getting to know that aspect of school, right? I think if you can, if you can understand the student discipline side, the restorative um, restorative practices side of schooling, really making those relationships with kids, uh, you're in a good spot. But on the other hand, it's negative a lot of times, right? You're, you're dealing with students with chronic behaviors. Um, those phone calls with parents are, are not fun. 
um, it's negative, negative, negative for most of it. So that's where I really started to feel it, even as a young administrator and looking at, you know, I'm right now I'm 32. So I'm still considered a young, a young administrator. So back then I'm, you know, 28, 27, 28, 29. Um, it helped me with my relationship making with the students. Um, but by all accounts, like my relationship or my, my responsibilities outside of school were not that much right we had i didn't have kids yet i you know was able to just kind of go and do my own thing at home i was married but it wasn't you know that wasn't a, a huge demand you know we were able we were doing our own things coaching doing that kind of stuff together she's a teacher as well um so we were kind of working on our own things but i was just feeling it when 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 i was working there because it was so demanding the the caseloads were so big um the attitudes of the conversations I had to have over and over were so negative. That's where I really started to feel like, oh, this is a slog. Like this is hard to do. Like not ex not as excited to come in during the day in the morning. Um, so that's where I really started thinking when I was in my doctoral program at Aurora University. Like how like how can I look into this to help myself? This is an interest I have. I was really into you know working out and doing things like that. So how can I help me feel better within this job and then also help others feel better? So what I'd love you guys to do right now, I'm just gonna take like a 30 second pause and just think about your position, your life, where you are right now. Um, and just, this is a little more personal, so I don't want anyone to have to share this out, but just take 30 seconds and identify some of the major stressor, stressors that you have in your position currently. All right, wonderful, thank you. So this next one we'll share out a little bit. So now we're gonna talk about the background of self-care. So I was gonna look into a bunch of different things with self-care when looking at the study. Um, one of my big things has been forever back when I played football in high school, tried it in college, um, then ended up coaching, but I was big into physical self-care, right? Working out, running, lifting. Um, that's where I would kind of, you know, hung my hat where I was grounded. Those are the things that I really liked doing. Um, but it was also getting a little bit harder, right? The, the time demands of the job were more um, as I started getting closer to having a, a family and having a kid with my wife, like those demands were more so that, you know, that physical care kind of started taking a back seat. So with self-care, I was also wondering, all right, what else can I do that maybe doesn't have some of those, those time demands that my physical self-care does, that working out does, you know, going and working out for an hour, two hours, whatever a night. Um, what are some other things that I could do? So what I'd love you guys to do right now in thinking about self-care for you is take one minute and identify things that you enjoy doing for yourself. Could be, could be anything, could be working out, um, reading a book, whatever the case may be. And I'd love for you to share that in the chat, if you would, um, with everyone, share it with everyone. What do you, just type in one thing, you know, that you really enjoy doing for yourself. So I see some good things on there. Some of you guys are combining multiple things, which is awesome, right? Taking a walk while also listening to music or talking with a loved one. The ability to go back to concerts, that's pretty nice that we can finally, uh, finally get back and do that. Spending time with family. Awesome. Thank you guys for, for sharing those. So, so those are, I think those are good to kind of keep in mind, right? Like 
how do you, what do you enjoy doing? And then we're going to talk a little bit about some different categories that self-care can fall in. And so you can then, you'll be able to relate, hey, what did I just share with everyone that I enjoy doing? All right now, what category of self-care does that fall in? And then how does that affect the level of burnout and the feeling of burnout um, that I may be feeling or an individual may be feeling? There we go. So the next thing um, we're going to look at is just some solutions, right? So we just talked about, um, so we're talking about burnout, where burnout came from, then we're talking about self-care. So how can we merge those two? How can we work on, you know, taking care of ourselves to end up with a solution to be better for us? So let's go ahead and just take another 30 seconds quickly um, and identify what you have tried to do to make yourself feel better, right? In a moment where you're feeling burnt out, you're feeling overloaded, you just are, are so fed up with everything and you're just like, I can't take it anymore. What are some things? And you can keep this, this is kind of personal too. So we'll keep this to ourselves, but identify, you know, what have you tried to do to make yourself feel better um, in that moment or if you're feeling that way right now? And I will say, as we go forward, you know, into this presentation, I do hope, you know, I hope that everyone's school year is off to a good start. Um, I know ours is, we implemented this year at my school, basically a no cell phones in the classroom. Kids have to have them away, or we have like a common area um, to store those. It's been going really, really well. Um, you know, in the past few years, we've walked into classrooms and seen kids on their phones, Snapchat, whatever. Um, phones are away. And I think it's been a huge relief for our students too. Um, so I hope your guys' school year are starting just as well as mine had. Hopefully it's back to normal with pretty minimal COVID precautions. I think all these things are going to combine to make for a, a really good school year for all of us. So let's talk a little bit about what this presentation is now and what this presentation is not. And hopefully some of the info that you'll bring away from it. So what this presentation is, it's a look at what you as an individual can do to lessen the feeling of burnout, right? So if you're feeling burnt out as an individual, what can you do? Um, so what it is not, right, it's not a look at what the organization can do to lessen the feeling of burnout in employees. So when you look at, at burnout and self-care, you can really look at it through two lenses, right? You can look at it through the lens of an individual on, all right, the system is what the system is. Now, what can you do to survive in that system? Now, there are a lot of people that will argue with that viewpoint saying, all right, well, we shouldn't, like, we can change the system. We don't, we shouldn't have to, you know, survive and live in a system that isn't set up to, you know, be the best for employees. And I, I would agree with that as well. Um, that's just the lens of the individual is the lens that I took for this study. Um, there are other studies out there and I think more studies that could be done to really look at what an organization can do, right? If you're in charge of an organization, if you're on a school board, if you're a district administrator, what are some things that you could do to lessen the burnout You know that people feel from what's going on in your schools? I think that's great, just not what we're looking at in this study specifically. Um, so this should be a quick lesson on burnout, self-care, and how they relate to one another. And then what it's not is a complete guide on the complex interactions of self-care burnout and an individual's ability to cope. So one of the things that we look at when we look at burnout and self-care, um, and I said it earlier, it's, it's really individualistic. So, you know, everybody is different. Everyone reacts differently. Everyone reacts differently to stressors. So if you put two people, two different people in the same situation, one person could be very overwhelmed and really start to feel that burnout. And another person would be just fine and say, hey, like, what's the matter? What's going on? So it really is when we're looking at this stuff, you know, we, I surveyed almost 500 administrators through, in public schools through the state of Illinois. Um, so we got a nice little idea of what's going on, but it is always good to remember, like everyone's different. Everyone handles stress different. Everyone like has different things going on in their lives outside of school. Um, so you really do have to look at this, you know, through that lens that this is a, a kind of a quick look at things. Um, but there's a lot of stuff that goes on behind the scenes that 
that it may not be accounted for for each individual. And then we're going to talk a little bit about things you can do to get the best bang for your buck when practicing self-care. So going through this study and some of the questions we had, there were some themes that came out like, hey, this is something that you can do that's actually really good and gives you kind of the, the best bang. So we'll, we'll go through that. Um, and hopefully you can take that away and, and start implementing that in your, in your daily lives. The second thing is this won't, this is not a guarantee, right? If you do this, right? If you practice this, if you listen to this book, if you do this music, if you work out two hours a week, um, that you won't feel burnt out, right? This is a good, good template for everybody, good guide, but this isn't necessarily, um, Dr. McCarty's guarantee that, hey, if you do this, you will never feel burnt out. So, um, as much as I wish that I could do that, I cannot. So let's talk about what is burnout. So this gives you, this will be like the book definition, right? So this is the definition that I used within my dissertation, um, a little bit wordy, but I think gives us a good idea and a good baseline of where we're coming from when we're talking about burnout. So burnout is a psychological condition and reaction to chronic stress that leads to a lack of productivity and ultimately to an employee removing themselves from the stimulus causing burnout. So I think that's a big thing about burnout. Burnout is on a continuum, all right? There's not one spot um, in the literature or when you're filling out um, the different instruments for burnout, that's like, all right, at this point you are burnt out. Um, it really is a continuum um, from less to more. Um, and the whole goal of a lot of the burnout reset, uh, research is to get away from that, that last part where, where the employee is trying to remove themselves from the stimulus, right? You see all this kind of stuff about people leaving education. When we're looking at the self-care and burnout research, that's really what we're trying to avoid. We don't want people to get to the point where they feel like they have to just leave the profession completely in order to avoid burnout. So burnout is composed of three different domains we're gonna talk about, and we'll talk about what each of those domains are in a second. Um, emotional exhaustion, depersonalization, and then personal accomplishment. Um, so we're going to talk about Maslach a, a, a little bit, but that's really where the, the main research um, from burnout comes. So that's what we have for burnout. Now let's talk about self-care a little bit and the definition that, that I, there's a lot of different definitions for self-care out there. The definition that I use for self-care in this study and what we're going to be looking at is self-care is a multidimensional, multifaceted process of purposeful engagement in strategies that promote healthy functioning and enhance well-being, right? So um, if you wanted your multi-syllabic words for today, um, really make you feel good, this is probably the, the definition for you. But the, the thing I wanna highlight in the self-care definition is that purposeful engagement, right? So it's not just something that happens, right? This is something that you're intentionally and thinking about, intentionally doing, all right, to promote a healthy functioning and well-being in yourself. So we are moving on. So what's the question? We talked about the question a little bit ago. So the overarching question of all this is, does practicing self-care reduce the feeling of burnout, right? That's what we want to know, right? Everyone on, you go on Twitter, you go on this, and it's like, hey, practice self-care, do this, have you done your self-care today? All right, you look, even uh, I was putting in the hashtags on Twitter last night when I was, I was posting this on my Twitter saying, hey, come join me um, tomorrow. And, you know, you start typing it into Twitter and it'll give you a bunch of different hashtags that come up with it. Um, I type in burnout, the hashtag burnout and not really much comes up. Um, but I typed in like hashtag self-care and there were like 10 different like hashtags with self-care that I could have picked from um, that other people have used. So it just kind of goes to show how many people are talking about self-care and what self-care is um, or talking about self-care, but not really giving much background into, all right, well, what is it? How do I do it? And how do I purposely practice self-care? So in order to understand some of these results, we're going to go through the two instruments that I use to measure this stuff. So the first one is burnout. So for burnout, we use the Maslach burnout inventory. This is like the gold standard when you are talking about burnout, measuring burnout in, um, in the research field. This is the thing that's used in the vast majority of the studies. Um, they have some different 
variations of it. The one I used was the educator survey. So in there, we have the three domains that we just covered. We have the emotional exhaustion domain, depersonalization, and then personal accomplishment. You'll see that the emotional exhaustion, I, I give a little asterisk to that um, because that's really like the main thing when we're talking about burnout and when you're feeling burnt out, it's probably that emotional exhaustion piece you're feeling. So emotional ex exhaustion is that tired and fatigued feeling that develops as your emotional energies are drained, right? As you're you're coming in day in, day out and you feel just beat up and you're, you're beating your head against the wall, whatever that, and you're just like, oh, I'm so done, I'm so tired. Like that's that emotional exhaustion feeling, All right? And then from emotional exhaustion, that starts rolling into depersonalization. So depersonalization, then once you feel so tired, tired, depersonalization is that cynical detached attitude that the professional takes towards work, their work environment, and the people with whom they interact. So in our line of work, right, it could be your coworkers, your other adults, it could be your students, right? And you're just, you're done. So you're in the classroom, you're teaching, you're just so tired of this one kid, doesn't work, doesn't work, just causing disruptions nonstop, and you just get cynical, detached, you don't work with them anymore. Could be the same for a coworker where, you know, you're just tired of that one, that one person or your boss, whoever that may be, um, and you just kind of detach from that. Uh, and you just become cynical about everything you're doing, right? I'm sure, especially in education where we have things that are cyclical, you know, are coming back through. We don't do this for a while, it comes back. We push everyone to college. Now we're going back to trade schools, you know? We look at your objectives and standards say this, and then they say this. Now they come back to that. You know, you get people that have been a few, through a few of those waves that that kind of gets cynical with some of that stuff. So it starts out with that emotional exhaustion. You feel tired. Once you start getting that emotional exhaustion, then that depersonalization kicks in. And then, and those are the two that really make up like this feeling of burnout, that, that play between emotional exhaustion and depersonalization. But there also is a, this personal accomplishment piece. Um, and really what you're feeling is a lack of personal accomplishment. And it, it kind of measures how little you're feeling. Um, and I think we can all relate, right? If you were in a cynical place, if you're detached from your work, um, the likelihood that you're going to feel personal accomplishment from that and or someone's going to recognize you for doing a good job is probably pretty low. So when looking at that personal accomplishment piece, it kind of stands on its own when we're looking at some of these things, um, but that does contribute to burnout and that lack of professional accomplishment really does. So those are the three things with burnout that we're gonna be talking about. Emotional exhaustion, depersonalization, and then personal accomplishment uh, with emotional exhaustion really being the big heavy hitter, making up the bulk of what you're feeling. All right, so now we're gonna talk about self-care. All right, so what I used was the uh, something called the mindful self-care scale. Um, it was it was developed by a, a lady out of New York. I think she's at, if I remember right, Buffalo University. Um, her last name's Cook Catone. And so what self-care does is it breaks self-care down into a bunch of different groups for us. So these are the six groups that we're going to be talking about. Um, and I think it's important to give you the definitions about these first. So then when we get into the results, you kind of have a, oh, okay, this makes sense, that makes sense. I'm gonna get through this entire screen and kind of talk about the definitions. And then I'm gonna tell you guys to take a picture of it, all right? Just so you have it for reference as we kind of go forward. Um, Cause I think it's really good when we start talking about, oh, what's that mean? What's that mean? And when we look at the results that you kind of have these definitions to um, go back to. So the, the, six, the six different domains that we're talking about with self-care are mindful relaxation, relaxation, excuse me, physical care, self-compassion and purpose, supportive relationships, supportive structure, and mindful awareness. And you'll notice that I highlighted that supportive structure and mindful awareness too. So let's go through quickly some of these um, definitions so that you guys can really get a good idea of what we're talking about some of these. And once we go over these definitions, you can really connect this to what you guys put in the chat about what you enjoy doing. All right, so first off, we're looking at mindful relaxation. So participating in non-physical activities could be intellectual, social, or sensory in order to relax. Right, so what are some of these things? Some of these things you guys were talking about, non-physical. So you could read a book, listen to music, 
um, listen to audiobooks. You can do crossword puzzles. You could do coloring. Um, you can just talk to somebody. Like these are all the, you know, social. So you're going out drinks, having parties with friends, whatever the case may be. So all of those types of things fall in this mindful relaxation category. The next one is physical care exactly what you think it is, right? Participating in physical activity. So it's not only just working out, but also the planning of, so nutrition, like looking at your nutrition, eating healthy, making sure you're exercising and the planning of these activities in order to improve oneself. And remember when we talked about self-care, right? These things are all on purpose. Like these are things you're purposely doing to better yourself. The next thing is self-compassion and purpose. So these things are characterized by positive self-talk, finding purpose in your work, um, and you do this in order to persevere through your personal hardships, your professional hardships, right? Having, you always have that thing, all right, I'm doing this because, right? Or you might have that moment in education that just clicks for someone, or you you help someone, you know, realize they, they want to do something else, right? A new, like, work their way up in education. So you help a teacher become an administrator, or you help a teacher become an instructional coach, or you help someone with a new practice, whatever that may be, like finding that purpose in your work to help you through the hard times is what that looks like. Next one, supportive relationships. So this one's feeling supported by and good about the people that are in your life, both personally and professionally. Right. So this might mean, right, if you really struggled with, you know, supportive relationships, this might mean taking a deep dive at, at who you surround yourself with. Right. Do you have a healthy group of friends? Do you have a healthy, you know, group and relationship with families? Uh, professionally, do you feel supported by, you know, the people that are your supervisors? Right. Are they in it for you? Are they, you know, are you working with people that you feel like, you know, help you be the best you can be? Um, going forward. So the support of the relationships is real important there. Um, and something you you can have a lot of control over or not so much depending on, on where you're at. Next one, supportive structure. So this is characterized by a work-life balance, right? So we're coming out of COVID. Many of us are administrators here. Um, you're laughing, hopefully laughing to yourself quietly and thinking, what what is that? What is work-life balance? Um, oh, you mean when ISBE releases stuff at, on Friday afternoon and, and makes us work all weekend to figure out how we're going to have school on Monday um, that supports work-life balance, that kind of stuff. So um, it's funny to think about. I think now that we're getting through there, I know that these past few years have not been easy in allowing us to have that balance, but supportive structure and what you're going to see is, is important in making sure that you know, the demands that you have and the time that you have for those demands are, are pretty equal. Um, it also looks at like keeping your physical workplace appealing and organized to support your work tasks, um, not being micromanaged, like feeling like you have the autonomy to come in and do your job and do what you need to do in order to be successful. Like all those things go into having a supportive structure that keep it so you can um, be the most efficient that you can be and do the best work that you can be. And then finally, mindful awareness. So this is maintaining a calm awareness of your thoughts and feelings and your body to guide your future actions. All right. I really relate mindful awareness to emotional intelligence. All right. Do you have that emotional intelligence where you can not only gain, you know, this is talking more about your thoughts and feelings, but you also understand other people's thoughts and feelings by, by working with them, by talking with them, by understanding their body language. All right. And how can you use, you know, that understanding of their, where they're at emotionally and where you're at emotionally to make sure that you're acting in a way to come up with the, the best result possible and or understanding that you aren't in a position to do the best possible and then removing yourself from that um, and getting someone else to help you or whatever the case may be um, to make sure you're doing that the best you can for your kids. So I'm gonna ask you guys, go ahead, take just, if you hadn't already, like this is the full definitions page, take your phone out, take a picture of this so you guys have these definitions. So then when we start talking about um, some of the different things that, that go together with self-care and how we've done this, that you can um, refer back to, back to this screen as well. And then I'm actually going to take a picture of this as well. So that way I can have it to refer to. Not that I haven't memorized all of this, right? But that way I can refer to that on my phone um, rather than going back in this presentation with you guys.
So those are the two, right? So we have we have burnout, what burnout is. Now we have self-care, how self-care is measured, and then the different domains that go into self-care. So the moment you guys have all been waiting for, you can give me a quiet drum roll. I'll give myself one too. What are the findings? What did, what did we find out about burnout, about self-care, how they are related to one another? So our first question was, does the type of self-care matter, right? So we just had those six types. Does the type of self-care matter? Does it matter if you do one over the other? Is there a larger um, effect size of one type over the other? So what we found is actually, yeah, yeah. We found out, or I found out, right, that the type of self-care does matter, right? It really does have an effect on that level of burnout. So what did we find? So emotional exhaustion, remember that was kind of our big piece in burnout. Emotional exhaustion, exhaustion is, you know, what you feel the most when we're talking about burnout. So it had a high negative correlation with supportive structure and a moderate negative correlation with mindful awareness. So what the heck does that mean, right? That's about a bunch of academic language. Well, here's what that means. So emotional exhaustion, what, what makes up the, the bulk of, you know, that burnout feeling had a high negative correlation with supportive structure. So we talked about supportive structure, right? I just told you to take that that picture of supportive structure, that work-life balance, um, keeping your physical workplace clean, not being micromanaged. So that means if you scored high on supportive structure when you were taking your mindful self-care scale, right, which means you have a very supportive structure, you don't, you feel like your workplace is good, you have a really good work-life balance, you are, don't feel micromanaged, you're empowered to do your own thing, that actually then cause your emotional exhaustion to be really low. So the, the more, the better you scored in that supportive structure, the more you had that balance, right? The lower your emotional exhaustion was, all right? And now I'm sure plenty of you are like, well, yeah, duh, that makes sense, right? If I, if I feel like I have everything in balance and I have enough time to do everything, I'm not gonna be so stressed and then not so exhausted. But um, our research backed that up, right? So if you can work on getting to a place where you have that balance, um, and you have that workplace that's inviting and, and you want to work and you have that ability to not be micromanaged and do your own thing. Um, that's really going to help you on the burnout side of things, right? The next thing we saw is that moderate negative correlation with mindful awareness. So remember, I, I said that that mindful awareness, I really relate to emotional intelligence, right? You have that calm awareness of your thoughts, your feelings, and your body to guide your future actions. So if you have that awareness or work on it, it's not something you can't work on, um, that also has a large effect on one's emotional exhaustion. So if you can see where you're at with you know, your thoughts, your feelings, and other people's thoughts and feelings, that's really going to help you on that you know, overall feeling of emotional exhaustion. The second part here is this depersonalization part. So I remember we talked about burnout. Emotional exhaustion kind of works its way into depersonalization. You feel you start feeling emotionally exhausted, and then that depersonalization comes in. So these have lower effect sizes, um, but they're still they still had effects. So depersonalization had a low negative correlation with self compassion and purpose, supportive structure, and mindful awareness. So we just talked about supportive structure and mindful awareness. So if you want to talk about remember we talked about like what's your bang for your buck, right? Here they are, right? These are the two. If you are score, if you can score high in the, you know, in your supportive structure domain and in for your mindful awareness domain, if you have those in a good spot, you're going to have big effects on emotional exhaustion, all right, and also on depersonalization. So if I was ever going to tell someone, hey, hey, what are these are the six domains? Like, if I have to pick one, like where should I spend my time? This is what I'd tell you. I'd said, you need to spend your time working on your supportive structure, right? And your mindful awareness. And that's going to give you the best bang um, for, for reducing your feeling of burnout, right? And then we also had, like we talked about that self-compassion and purpose um, also helps you feel a little bit less with the, the burnout and the depersonalization. So this is important to know. This is kind of this, like answers that question, right? Where's that, where do you get your best bang? This is it, right, in those two areas, supportive structure and mindful awareness. So the next thing we looked at is administrator differences, all right? Are there differences between administrators who practice self-care and those who do not, 
right? Does it does it really matter? Can we see these differences? So this is going to be we're going to go to a chart next. A little overwhelming at first, but I think once I explain it to you, it'll it'll make a lot of sense. All right, so we have this chart here. So this is what I ended up looking at in the study. You can see across the top, we have the domains for self-care, right? Mindful relaxation, physical care, self-compassion and purpose, so on and so forth. On, so we looked at the those domains for self-care, and then I looked at different variables for administrators, right? We wanted to see if there were differences. So here are the things that I looked at for this. So we looked at the age of the administrator and we broke it up. So the age of the administrator, the administrative experience they had, not just educational experience, but specifically administrative experience, the gender of the administrator, the degree, the highest degree held that the administrator had, the administrator's title, the salary of the administrator, the type of school, you know, were you a high school, middle school, elementary school, a combination, the number of stu students that school had, was your school low income or not? So I, I just used the 40% the threshold for that. So was your school designated low income or 40% or more of your kids low income or not? Um, discipline percentage, because I really wanted to know this personally, because when I was a dean, that's when I was really feeling this, right? And I'm doing discipline and attendance all the time. So I'm like, man, this has to be part of it. Um, so we looked at, you know, do you feel like you were doing discipline zero to 20%, 20 to 40, 40 to 60, um, to kind of get a breakdown of how much people were doing discipline. Um, and then the number of other administrators you have, right, which goes right along with your size of school, the number of students, the more students you have, the more number of administrators you have. So you can see we have a lot of no's and then we have some yeses, all right? So what the yeses mean are, that means there was a significant difference in administrators that do and do not practice self-care um, with those. So let's go through a few of these just so you can kind of see what I'm talking about. So with degree, you can see here for degree, administrators that had a doctorate degree actually scored significantly higher in these four domains than administrators that only had a master's. So this was one of the more interesting things I found in this study is this was the, you know, the type of degree you had if you had a doctoral degree or not actually was a bigger predictor of, you know, where you scored on a lot of these different self-care um, domains. So if you had a doctoral degree, you scored higher in mindful relaxation, physical care, self-compassion and purpose and supportive relationships compared to your peers that only had a master's degrees. Um, one of the other things that I think we'll all like seeing, and we can take this back to our, our school boards and whoever else decides our salaries, um, in both of these salary spots, so in mindful relaxation and self-compassion and purpose, administrators that have a salary between, I believe it's $125,000 to $150,000, they actually scored significantly higher than administrators that have a salary between 75,000 and then that 124,000 mark, right? So we can go back and we can let everybody know that we all do need to get paid more money, right? Because that does have an effect on, on our self-care, right? On our mindful relaxation and on our, our self-compassion and purpose. The mindful awareness one in the top right corner, just uh, show a little bit because we just talked about how mindful awareness is um, a pretty big factor looking at emotional exhaustion. With mindful awareness, really what we saw is that administrators ages 31 to 40, so younger administrators actually scored significantly better in mindful awareness than older administrators, than administrators that were 51 years of age or older. And then the, the last two things I think I want to point out here is this gender right? Were there differences between males and female administrators? There really weren't until you get to this re supportive relationships piece. And I, this is something I took a little bit of a dive into, but it's something interesting for us to ponder about, you know, why would, in this case, males scored higher than females in supportive relationships as administrators? Um, my take on it personally was that, um, was more of a stereotypical take where, 
we have, you know, women's women and women households that have, you know, typical, traditional, stereotypical gender roles, possibly, um, where these administrative roles take up more time. So then you're maybe not feeling as supported at home because you feel pulled from work from those traditional roles that, that people fill in the household. Um, obviously, that's, a, that's an individual thing. That was just my take on it. But I think it's something too interesting to look at where we're seeing that these supportive relationships, really men do feel more supported um, in their relationships than our, our female administrators do. Um, the last thing that we looked at degree, really what I want to point out is some of the things that were just no across the board um, that I thought was interesting. I thought for sure, you know, I thought for sure we'd see something with low income schools, just with everything that that could go on with that. And those were some of my assumptions going into the study that were proven wrong. Really, if you're an administrator working at a low income school, you had no differences um, when you compared yourself to administrators that did not work at a low income school. Um, and then same thing with the, the number of students and the number of admin that had no effect on any of the self-care domains either. Um, personally, I was pretty surprised on this. You know, I went from a school that was 2,700 students and a caseload of 900 to uh, now I'm at a high school of about 250 students. Um, I can tell you that it was a little stressful when you're trying to go to the bathroom at the large school and people are calling you on the radio and you aren't even able to use the restroom. Um, and now at a smaller school where I'm actually able to use the restroom without being bothered, um, as well as just finding, it's easier for me to find more time to, to build some genuine relationships with my, my staff and my students. So those were some things on there that I was, I was pretty surprised about and just some things I wanted to highlight for you guys when we're looking at administrative differences and really where did we see, you know, differences within our self-care domains based on what we looked at with our administrator differences. So the last thing we're looking at does, does frequency matter? So I wanted to know, all right, how often do you practice self-care? Does that matter? So what we found out was yes, the frequency does matter. And this might be one of my most simplistic findings in this entire study is what we found is administrators who more often practice self-care and we did it by day. So we looked at, did you, did you practice, you know, no days, one to two, three to four, five to six, um, or all seven days? Did you practice these things? Um, so administrators who more often practice self-care in any of the domains, it doesn't matter which one, in any of those six self-care domains have lower emotional exhaustion scores, lower depersonalization scores, and higher personal accomplishment scores. So what does that mean? It means that across the board, as you went up in days, if you went from zero to one, right, or zero to one to two days, one to two days scored higher than zero, two to three, or three to four days scored higher than one to two, five to six scored higher than three to four. So across the board for all the things that we looked at in those self-care domains, all right, administrators who more often practice self-care, right, are more frequent about it. Remember, this is purposeful. So you're more purposeful and more frequent. You're going to see lower levels of burnout across the board. You're going to see lower feelings of emotional exhaustion. You're going to feel lower levels of depersonalization. And because those are level are lower, you're going to feel higher personal accomplishment. You're going to feel like you're doing something, like you're accomplishing something. People are going to notice that you're doing these things, right? Compliment you on those things um, to really go there. So we talked about like best bang for your buck earlier, looking at those um, supportive structures and mindful awareness, where I'd point you for that. Well, I think this is the other huge takeaway is um, if you can't, like if those don't Fit, if that's not really working for you, whatever the case may be, it really doesn't matter what you do as long as you do it often, right? The more often you pick your domain of self-care and, and do that, the better off you're going to be. And it really doesn't matter what domain. So if you have, if you're a physical care, right? If you're huge into working out or walking, whatever the case may be, the more often you can do that, the better off you're going to be.
So let's talk a little bit about, like, we talked about some findings where we're at. That's a lot of information to throw at you guys in a, a 20 minute span. Um, but let's, uh, these are some of the things that, this is my order of importance, what I found um, when doing this study. So the first one's the one we just went over, all right? Because this I think helps everybody. The more frequently that you can practice self-care, that you can do something that falls within those self-care, those six self-care domains, the better off you're going to be and the lower a level of burnout you're going to experience. All right, the second one is self-care matters, it does. So going through this study, we did wanna see, you know, does practicing self-care lower the level of burnout for an individual practicing it? And it does, and you can see that in a few different ways, right? You can focus on a few different domains and they have pretty high impacts on emotional exhaustion and then that ends up being your feeling of burnout or you can focus more on on whatever you want and do it more frequently frequently and that's going to lower that feeling of burnout um, it doesn't really matter what you do as long as you do it and that's going to help you with that feeling of burnout so practicing self-care now hopefully you have a better idea of what is self-care, right? We talked about instead of just saying, oh, self-care, self-care, do it. Like now you know what it is. Now you know how you can practice that and how it falls into those categories. Hopefully that helps you going forward, All right? I did that obviously probably a little bit biased here, right? Being a younger administrator, but I do think age matters, right? We talked about that mindful awareness um, portion there where younger administrators, administrators ages 31 to 40 um, have a higher mindful awareness score than administrators 51 plus. So I do think age matters with that, um, but obviously that's that's on a whole and not as an individual thing. Number four, education matters, right? It showed that the most, um, when we're comparing administrators, administrators with a doctoral degree, right, had the most domains for the six domains where we had significant, um, they were sig scored significantly higher than people that administrators that just had their master's degree. Um, and then finally, one for all of us, take this back, right? Salary matters, right? The more you get paid, right? That allows you to, to score higher in, in two of those self-care domains. So we're gonna take, we're gonna do a, probably just quick five minutes on some implications for practice and research. Um, and then we're gonna open up for questions and comments. So it's all on here. We'll just start in the top left and then we'll, we'll go down and then across. So talk about building leaders. If you're a building leader, um, what can you do? What's your implication for this? Um, I think choosing the right area of self-care, choosing something you enjoy doing, practicing that frequently is a big takeaway from this. Um, if you're looking to get your best bang for your buck, remember working on that supportive structure, keeping that office clean, making sure it's ready to go, you know, finding yourself a boss that doesn't micromanage you and where you have autonomy to do what you find the need to do. Um, and that supportive structure too is also that finding balance. That's a big one. I know it's hard, um, but really working on, you know, turning off the, the emails when you come home. I'm not looking at things till you get back to work, you know, turning off things at the, um, not looking at things over the weekend. And then by finding that balance, you can lead by example, right? And not send your staff emails after hours, not send stuff over the weekend, right? Encouraging your staff to take those steps to also find balance in their lives um, and really make them feel better about themselves. Now, if you're a district leader, what, what are some things that you could do from a district leader perspective? Um, you really gotta work to find, right? To find leaders, to find administrators working with you. Um, that you don't have to micromanage. You don't want to micromanage people, right? It takes time away from what you're trying to do. Um, but micromanaging is also just damaging to what they're trying to do and the supportive structure that an administrator is trying to foster. Um, so don't micromanage your administrators. Um, if you're hiring a new administrator, you're hiring a new principal, whatever you're doing, um, look for emotional intelligence. Try to find some questions to learn about gauge people's emotional intelligence like you know can they can they understand different situations or scenarios um can they read body language can they do these things that are going to help them in that um position so if you can find someone that has a high emotional intelligence likelihood is that then that translates to them having a lower um, lower level of burnout in the future um, and district leaders, same as building leaders, support balance, all right? I know as a district leader, as a superintendent especially, you're on 24-7, your, your phone's always on, um, but doing your best to be that filter um, and really deciding, you know, what can wait until the next school day um, or if something, you know, an emergency has to be passed on. 
Um, I did talk a little bit about policymakers and university programs just for legislators uh, in Illinois specifically. Our school code is absurd. Um, it is just so large, so many laws. Um, so can we really do an audit of that and see what's actually helping students and what isn't? And, and how can we make it so our educators can focus on education? Um, and then just making sure that there's, there's frequent communication with superintendents, with schools, with people in their districts to see how different educational laws are gonna affect what we're doing actually in our buildings. Um, and then finally for university programs, if any of you guys are, are looking at doing, you know, teaching adjunct or working with university program, going back, getting a doctorate, um, university programs, I think, really should teach about burnout and self-care. They should take time to talk about some of the stressors and things that we deal with as administrators and how they can work through dealing with that. Um, they should provide tools to diagnose that stuff. The two tools I have today um, for you I went over was the Maslach Burnout Inventory. That does have a cost associated with it. Um, and then the other one was the Mindful Self-Care Scale. That does not have a cost associated with it. That is free on um, <clears throat> excuse me, on Cook Catone's website. So you can Google mindful, mindful self-care scale um, and you can give that out to free. You can give it out to staff um, and kind of get an assessment on where people are with their self-care. Um, and then also just continuing to push mentorships. I know IPA does a great job with mentorships as well, um, but really having someone that you can go to, trust in, communicate with, um, and is there to support your growth. So that's kind of my um, implications and takeaways. So look at that, 354 on the dot. Arlen, give me a, give me a little prize for this. Um, thank you guys so much for joining me today. Uh, I'm really excited to be sharing this information with you. Um, I'm really excited that you decided to take an, out, an hour out of your day um, to join me in this. Um, and it's, it's something I'm, I'm very passionate about. And then I am also love um, just helping out, helping out the, you know, our other administrators. I'm going to type in for everybody my email address, my work email address. If anybody has questions, um, anything like that needs to reach out to me for anything, you guys can reach me at my work email address um, and I would be more than happy to help out. So if you guys have any questions or comments, Arlen, if you want to open things up, I'm good to go. Wonderful. Dr. McCarty, thank you so much for sharing this research with us, um, these wonderful strategies of self-care to prevent burnout. This has been a terrific session. We now have five minutes left um, to address any specific questions that our audience now has. Feel free to raise your hand and I can enable your microphone so you can speak on the mic. Um, or of course, you can type into the chat uh, as well. We can see your questions there. And there's also a Q&A pod if you want to type your questions privately to us, you can use the Q&A pod, but chat's open. Um, put your thank yous in there to Dr. McCarty for sharing this information. And again, raise your hand from the panel in the lower portion of your screen, and I can enable your microphone to talk. Uh, Dr. McCarty, in the beginning, right when you first started, Alex posted a question in chat that I wanted to come back to. Uh, Alex said, a lot of teachers with spouses in education are pretty understanding of the job and stresses. Any advice for those teachers that have a spouse or significant other in another field and may not understand the stress load during the school year? Oh, that's a, that is a great question. I don't know if I have the magic bullet. I can tell you I started out with, with my spouse not being in education and then she changed her mind and has gotten into education and, and that's made things a lot easier. Um, just from the conversations that, that we have had. So I don't, I don't think normally telling your spouse to change their, change their profession is, is a, a great answer to that. Um, but part of that, I, I think just really is making sure that any spouse has an understanding of, of what you're doing and why you're doing it, right? What's that purpose behind what you're doing? Um, and some of those time commitments that come to it, um, especially from a lot of other professions, um, they might not see that, um, you know, that purpose, that thankfulness in the paycheck that you're bringing home, unfortunately. Um, but that's, that's the best I can kind of do for that. I don't, that's a, that's a really tough one. Um, and it really just starts with that open communication and, and, you know, inviting them in, Hey, come see what, come see what I'm doing. Come with me. If you have after hours events, like come on, like make it a, a family type thing. Wonderful. Thank you for that. Uh, Matt asks, 
What are some things that are you, you are doing strategically in your role to provide self-care opportunities for your staff, uh, professional development or professional learning opportunities? So I, we haven't delved with my staff partic in particular, um, we haven't delved too far into any of the, the self-care stuff yet with, with professional development. Um, what I've tried to do personally is just not overwhelm them. Um, a big thing that I've really tried to do is, is keep things focused and keep things um, like on what we're trying to do moving forward. So I'm trying not to inundate them with things um, and try to keep those expectations and line of, lines of communication open. Um, the really nice thing for me, I'm, I'm blessed and I work in a small, like a really small school, 250 kids. Like I said, I have, you know, 25 teachers in the building on a given day. Um, so it's easy for me. I can walk through and check in with every teacher on every given day if I need to. So I'm, I'm blessed with being able to do that. Excellent. And Christine says, this is important for us to review and consider now at the start of the school year and not later. So great. Thank you, Dr. McCarty, for doing this presentation with us early in the school year. Yeah, no problem. And then Brandon said, helpful information on where to potentially focus to have the biggest impact for our own self-care. Thank you for that, Brandon. Appreciate those comments. Yeah. Brandon representing the district next door, Hinkley Big Rock. Oh, perfect. Yeah. Yeah, we like to get as many participants from all across the state as we can with these ELN live events. So that is terrific. All right, I don't see any hands raised and we've still got one minute. If you'd like to type anything into the chat, um, this presentation was recorded. I will be sending out the webinar recording and a link to an online evaluation, which once you complete it, Illinois participants will get one professional development clock hour for attending this session today. So be on the lookout in your email uh, tomorrow at some point as I get the recording prepared and get the email out to everybody. All right, Dr. McCarty, we wanna thank you once again for presenting on this important topic for Ed Leaders Network and the Illinois Principals Association. Everyone is free to hover down in the lower right-hand corner of their screen and leave the meeting room that will log you out of the session for today. Dr. McCarty, you are free to go as well. All right, wonderful. Thanks again, everybody. I, I really appreciate the opportunity.